Uh, thanks for giving the opportunity to speak here about our work on um, perovskite solar cells. Um, crucially, the title of my talk is Towards Achie Achieving Long-Term Stability. I'm not going to say that we have achieved it yet, but I think we're making some, some steps in the right direction. So um, luckily, I've come a second in this session, so I don't have to introduce much about the perovskite solar cells. But I would like to say that there's a few fundamental properties of the material that are actually responsible for the, the quick developments in the field. Uh, the first is that the materials are very easily process, solution processable from commonly available precursors. The second is actually probably most important that um, the materials display very long abipolar diffusion lengths over one micron. This enables them to function in well, many different types of architectures, in, including thin film sort of architectures. And third, um, the materials have very controllable band gaps. So you can play with the halide content of the, uh, of the crystal structure. And that way, you can actually tune the band gap from around 2 electron volts down to 1.4 electron volts. And this is uh, very important if we want to use the material as a top cell in tandem cells, for example, with, uh, with silicon as the back cell. And this is becoming more and more uh, realistic since silicon cells are becoming rapidly, uh, but maybe even painfully for this community, uh, cheaper. So that's why we've, uh, this, is, this is something to, to bear in mind, that we can actually use these as very cheap top cells in silicon tandems. Okay. Uh, as we've already heard, the, uh, the efficiencies have increased from about 10% two years ago up to 17% certified. So that means that um, essentially the main, one of the main issues to solve now is the stability. So what I'd like to do today is discuss some of the different architectures that you'll find if you, if you research uh, the literature. We use more or less three or four different architectures. I'll focus on these three today and see how we can play with these architectures to affect both the light soaking stability as well as thermal and, hum and humidity uh, induced degradation. So the first architecture I'll be talking about is, um, is this one, which is based on the dye sensitized sort of structure. Essentially what we've done here is we've replaced the dye in the dye sensitized solar cell with the perovskite absorber. Crucially, the perovskite is not continuous along this mesoporous TI2 film, so it acts just as a sensitizer. The uh, perovskite gets photoexcited, you generate electrons which are injected into TI2, holes are transported then through an organic hole transporter up to the cathode. If we take this, this, uh, this, this structure one step further, which happened maybe a few months after this initial uh, report of th this sort of structure, we have a system where we actually infiltrate the mesoporous TI2 completely with the perovskite. In this case, we think we still have electron injection into the TI2. There's a lot of spectroscopic evidence that supports this. And then there's hole transport through the perovskite. And then we still, in our, in our group, we still use uh, selective hole contact on top, and this gives us the best performances. We've also um, developed a structure, this was something that came out of our lab, where we, we replaced the mesoporous TI2 completely, and we, instead we use either a mesoporous alumina scaffold or, or no scaffold at all. And this work seems to work quite well as, as well. All of these structures are more or less in the same ballpark of efficiency, around 15 up to 17 percent. Uh, so I'll, I'll be talking about how, first I'll start with talking about this structure. And this, like I said, this functions like a dye sensitized solar cell. You can, you can have a dye or a perovskite, it doesn't really matter. Your light is, uh, is absorbed, electrons transferred to the, elect to the TI2. Uh, electrons are transported by this multiple trapping model, and the holes are transported by hopping through the hole transporter. Okay, so crucially in this structure, the electron transport occurs through the TI2, the hole transport occurs through the hole transporter. So this, this is the crucial thing to bear in mind for the next uh, few slides. So I take a few of these, these solar cells, I encapsulate them, and I put, just put them under our solar simulator for a few hours, and it's a bit painful to watch what happens when you've encapsulated the solar cell. That's, I mean, that's four hours, and it doesn't work whatsoever anymore. Now, if you place, if you don't encapsulate, for some reason, it's more stable. This was extremely surprising. Uh, then if you take the encapsulated solar cell, but you use a UV filter, you see that it's actually much more stable. So what we have is a situation where we have a several hour um, degradation induced by UV light and that is accelerated, accelerated in the absence of oxygen. And this is mostly due to the, the change in the, uh, in the short circuit current. Um, if we just take a UV vis spectrum, we see there's almost no change. So the solid lines are the encapsulated samples, the dotted lines are the non-encapsulated samples. There's almost no change. So it doesn't seem to be a, a physical degradation happening based on some preliminary data there. So then we try it on the normal, traditional dye-sensitized solar cells to see is it a problem with the perovskite or is it the, the architecture itself. And we see the dye-sensitized solar cells suffer from exactly the same problem. This is 20 minutes, and we have, uh, well, maybe a 
the current goes to a third of what it used of what it was before the UV treatment. If we use a UV filter, you find that the current is actually well, the whole JV curve is much more stable. So it's the same exact process. These are note that these are these are done in vacuum, and when we expose the cells back to air, wait a few hours and measure again, and we go right back up to this point. So this is a reversible degradation in the absence of oxygen in the presence of UV light. Um, so to get a better idea of what's going on, we wanted to figure out, are we affecting the charge generation or are we affecting charge collection in these solar cells? And this is a, we've, so we used a method that I've developed in our lab that's quite, that we really enjoy because it allows us to measure both the charge generation and the charge transport at the same time if, uh, effectively. So what we do is we combine transient absorption spectroscopy, uh, via which you can monitor the photo-induced charge population of your sample, together with the charge extraction measurement on, on a solar cell, so in situ. We take a solar cell, with a semi-transparent uh, gold contact, we shine a laser pulse at it. We look at the change in absorption of the sample at a wavelength at which we know what the extinction coefficient is for the photo-induced charges. But at the same time, we monitor the current extracted from the cell. And what we see, if we, so we have blue here is the uh, unencapsulated sample. Then we have, this is the current over here. Blue is the unencapsulated sample. Gray is the encapsulated sample. And then red is the encapsulated sample after, after maybe half an hour under full solar radiation. And what we see, the biggest difference is actually the current extracted, whereas the charge generation, which, you, which we get an idea of by this initial amplitude, so this, this tells us the initial amount of, of, of uh, photon-induced charge generated by the, uh, the laser perturbation. That doesn't change. So the charge generation is the exact same regardless of the aging, but it's the collection that's changing. And we can quantify, we can, com we can integrate the area under this curve compared to the initial amplitude here, since we know the extinction coefficient. And then we can calculate the charge collection efficiency. And we see that it drops from 100 down to 14% when you remove oxygen and expose these cells to UV light. Um, it's not that surprising, I guess, that TI2 based cells suffer under UV light, but it wasn't something that had been really addressed uh, before. Uh, now, if there's a problem in charge collection, we've, there's, there's two, two, two things that could happen. You could either have rapidly increased uh, recombination rates, or you could have much worse uh, charge transport. And um, the way we like to distinguish between between the two, especially in this complex system. We have, we have electron transport through TI2 as well as hole transport through the hole transporter. So there's, it's a quite a complex system. The way we'd like to look at this is to split up the components into, into their individual, into individual devices. And so we have here um, a sample where we have just a mesoporous TI2 that's sensitized by a dye. Now here, when we, and then we, we contact it on both sides with gold. So we can monitor the, the conductivity of the mesoporous TI2. When we use uh, laser perturbation, you inject electrons into the TI2, your photoconductivity increases. And so you see that you have this spike in the photoconductivity after the laser perturbation. At the same time, you perform transient absorption spectroscopy, and you look at the bleach of the dye molecule to tell you again about the charge, genera charge generation. And what we see is that when we take the sample and expose it to UV light, there's no difference in the charge generation, again, but there is a difference in the initial amplitude of the photoinduced uh, conductivity of the electrons. This tells us essentially that a large portion of the injected electrons are actually being immediately trapped, and they're not contributing to any photoconductivity. If we do the same measurement monitoring the, uh, the hole conductivity in the spiroomatad, here we make sure that we contact only the hole transporter, and we're, we're, because we have this, this capping layer of hole transporter on top of the sample. So we can be sure we're measuring only hole conductivity. No, no electrons will be contributing to the current here. And again, we do the same experiment, and we see that the, uh, the initial conductivity jump is the same. There's an increased recombination rate, however. So this, this means that we have a situation where we're trapping electrons, and then they're recombining more rapidly with the holes on the hole transporter. So this allows us to form a picture of, of the degradation mechanism, or propose a picture, maybe, is, is a better word to, say, better word to use. So we, we postulate that it's all to do with these surface states on, uh, on, on TI2. TI2 is known to contain many oxygen vacancies. And at these oxygen vacancies, you'll have essentially a filled electron to which molecular oxygen will absorb. And this will happen during our normal processing steps in air. Then once, um, once we excite the TI2 with UV light, you generate an electron conduction band, hole in the valence band. This hole in the valence band uh, recombines with this trapped electron that was here. And the oxygen will, will leave the surface. This is a commonly observed effect in mesoporous TI2, not within the solar cell community, but in, in uh, photocatalysis, for example. And then what you have is you, you're end, you end up being left with an empty trap site that's no longer passivated by the, by the surface adsorbed oxygen. Now, if you inject from a dye, the dye is likely to inject here, or it will inject to the conduction band and then be trapped. It doesn't matter. Either way, once you've trapped your electron, there's a rapid recombination process here, and you've introduced 
a loss pathway. So this is what we propose is what's behind this UV-induced uh, um, oxygen-free accelerated uh, degradation. If this, is, if this is what's causing the degradation, then if we remove this context, then we should be able to improve the, uh, the stability of the solar cell. One way to do that is to use this architecture, where there, now there's no longer a contact between the whole transport layer and the mesoporous TiO2. Of course, there's a contact between the perovskite and the TiO2, but I'll, I'll discuss why that is not quite as important uh, in just a second. So what, we can, what we can do is we can tune how much of the perovskite is inside of the TiO2 mesopores by simply changing our spin coding parameters, our concentrations, and the TiO2 thickness. And so we've managed to tune it from around 40% down to 100% pore filling in the TiO2. And we, we measure this very simply. We just weigh our substrate before and after, and we know the density of the perovskite from XRD unit cell, from the unit cell of the perovskite. So we, we have a rough indication of that. In this architecture, we have a situation that looks like this, where we have no, no uh, contact between the spiral and the TiO2. In these solar cells, we can then monitor the charge extraction lifetimes as well as the charge recombination lifetimes so via small perturbation, photocurrent, and photovoltage decays. Uh, you can see that the charge transport lifetime doesn't seem to be affected. So here, all these different colors are just the different amounts of pore filling of perovskite in the structures. You see that there's not much change. You, you maintain this, this trend in um, the charge transport lifetime with the, uh, with the charge density in the device. And this is commonly observed in a dye cell-like device where the charge transport is limited by uh, electron, well, by trap-limited diffusion in the, elect in the TiO2. Then if we look at the at the, uh, the photovoltage decays, we see that there's two discrete classes of behavior. There's um, the cases where we have low perovskite pore filling, where there's a high spiro or whole transporter TiO2 contact. That's here. You see this sort of sharper, sharper slope. Then we have the case where we remove that contact by infiltrating with perovskite. So now we have this case, and we see that we have a much less steep slope. It doesn't look that big, but considering um, that all dye cells will follow on, on this curve, it is quite a big difference. And uh, so what we've actually done is we've removed the recombination pathway from here to here, and that slowed the net recombination in the solar cell. So of course, you're going to say, well, why can't you just recombine with the holes in the perovskite? The reason for that is that the, the, the hole mobility in the perovskite is so incredibly high that you will never maintain a very large charge density in the perovskite. So there's almost no holes to recombine with. They make it, the holes in the perovskite will go into the spiral within nanoseconds. OK, so then you, you take one of these devices, it's a bit more stable, but it's still not great. Uh, I mean, to down to 50% in uh, four and a half hours is still not good enough, obviously. So the next step is let's get rid of the mesoporous TiO2 altogether. So we do that. We use our, our structure where we use mesoporous alumina or planar header junction. It doesn't matter too much. And we see that we actually maintain a stable, more or less stable photocurrent for at least 600 hours. And then we have some, some decrease over the last 400 hours. And this is just a um, solar cell encapsulated tested at 40 degrees under full, the full solar spectrum. So no UV filter or nothing. Uh, so, it's, so what we, we show here is that at least we can now sidestep this initial degradation that we were observing with our TI2-based solar cells. We no longer have this really rapid UV degradation. Of course, we, can, we could just use a UV filter, but because mesoporous TI2 will actually absorb up to past 400 nanometers, you'll be cutting out a large part of your, of your visible spectrum. And if you can have a solar cell that doesn't require UV filter, you might, you might as well use it, I guess. So, that's what we, we think we're moving in the right direction. This is obviously uh, not there yet. Uh, there's still lots of other, other than the UV effect, there's lots of other effects that we need to consider. And that's what the second part of my talk is about. So the perovskite is known, well, I think it's famously a bit unstable. People like to, people like to say that um, it'll degrade like when you sneeze on it, that sort of thing. And it, it does actually, it's very sensitive to humidity. And so, what, what, we, what we can do is we can try to play with the actual architecture of our solar cell to try to protect, protect the solar cell from humidity and heat-induced degradation simply by changing the layers of the solar cell. Uh, what you see here is we have our normal configuration. We have a normal configuration where we have the uh, mesoporous alumina, no, no TI, the TI2-free solar cell, essentially. And we then coat that with our normal hole transporter. This is an organic hole transporter with a lithium dopant. And you see, just leaving it on a hot plate at 80 degrees for 100 hours in, well, in the room, so about 60% relative humidity, because we, we are in England. And then we have, uh, well, as you can see from the color that you no longer have your methyl ammonium lead trihalide perovskite. What we, in fact, have is we end up with uh, lead iodide. Uh, 
So we propose that if, there's, if we can get water into our perovskite, uh, so this doesn't happen when you do the same thing in, in, the, in the glove box, as has been mentioned earlier uh, during the conference. So what, what we propose that happens is that water can solvate uh, the crystal structure, and then with the heat, you drive off the methyl ammonium iodide, leaving behind just uh, lead iodide. If we use a, a different layer on top, instead of our conventional hole transporter, if we use, let's say, a protecting polymer like PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, we can completely stop this process, at least on, the, on this time scale of 100 hours on a hot plate. Still not, obviously, a standardized test or anything, but it's an improvement. So the thought then is, well, why don't we, if we could get a whole transporter, a whole transport layer that has this property, but that isn't insulating like PMA is, then we'd be moving a, a step in the right direction. So we then decided to use this quite strange architecture. When we first talked about it, I was convinced it wouldn't, wasn't going to work. And what we do is we, we spin coat just a layer of carbon nanotubes on top of the perovskite. These carbon nanotubes have been wrapped with P3HT. And this way, um, this way you actually make these carbon nanotubes whole selective. So they can, they can, they can work as a, well, as a P-type uh, whole collect, collect, collection layer. And then we spin coat PMA on top of that. And it turns out when you do that, you actually have, well, you might, I don't know if you can see this. It's not, maybe not the best quality picture. But what, when you do that, you actually end up having carbon nanotubes sticking out through the PMA layer. And they can, they can reach, they can reach the, uh, the gold electrode. So then... Right, we made the solar cells, and they work surprising, surprisingly well. I mean, we have up to 15% power conversion efficiency using this carbon nanotube layer followed by a protective insulating uh, polymer matrix. Um, and we see, well, the reproducibility may, is not quite as great as for some of our standard systems, but these, these are things that we're working on. But we have managed to effectively encapsulate then our solar cell while still making a conductive layer on top. And you can see if we then use a variety of different hole transporters, so the normal, Spiro, P3HT, uh, PTA, which has been uh, in the literature a few times, um, and then our new uh, composite uh, hole transport layer, you actually see that this is, this is thermally stable. And if we take the sample for 100 hours, heat it at 80 degrees on a hot plate, you can see the before and after. There's almost no, no change in the, uh, in the power conversion efficiency, 11 to 12 percent before, 11 to 12 percent afterwards. So we have, at least on this time scale, completely uh, stopped this, this um, thermal and humidity-induced degradation of the, of the perovskite. In fact, this, these PMA layers are so protective that we can hold the solar cell under the tap for a minute, as we did here. It's a bit of a silly experiment. Uh, and you can see that there's no change in the, in the performance, 12.9 to 12.7 before and after a minute under the, light, under the, under the water. So while this is no standardized test. It's not, this is no guarantee that the cells will last for several thousand hours in the real world. It means that we're already making steps towards the right direction. And obviously, uh, we, we, need to keep, we need to keep working at that. Then, since we now have a system that's thermally stable, we can test the solar cells at different temperatures. And uh, with the normal hole transporters that we normally use, with the lithium TFSI doped spiro, we see this rapid degradation. is not reversible. But with the new, uh, the new structure, we actually have somewhat more, uh, well, we have a much, much lower slope of, of decrease, and this is reversible. So this means that it's not a degradation, it's just in a, giving us an idea of the temperature coefficient of the solar cell. This is actually not so bad for a solar cell, that it only loses about 80% of its performance at 90 degrees. That's actually quite, quite good. So, yeah, we've made, we're making progress, and uh, thank you, thank you for listening. Ah, um, well, we, I haven't got on here, but we have a paper submitted now on quantifying the charge transport. And um, we find that the whole transport through the carbon nanotube network in the, in the polymer is much faster than the undoped spiral, similar to the doped spiral, but always slower than the perovskite. So no matter what whole transport we use, it will almost always be slower than that in the perovskite. So you will have some charge accumulation happening in, in that layer, but it seems to not ma matter too much. Hmm? But the efficiency is lower for the with carbon nanotubes. Well, no, we have 15% uh, with the carbon nanotubes. The same as the same as with the spiral. Yeah.
What was the um, cutoff wavelength of your UV uh, filters? So the UV filter I used there was 420 nanometers. Okay, and does it, is that very sensitive if you... Um, I've, I've, to be honest, I should have done, but I haven't done a careful dependence of the, uh, of the, uh, of the cutoff wavelength. The 420 was still, it looked more stable, but that was four hours and there was already some degradation. So I imagine to really solve the issue, you need to be going further, because there is an absorption tail in TI2, to about 450 nanometers or so. So I imagine you have something like that. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hi there. Um, all these devices, you did the processing in the glove box and uh, follow up to get a low cost processor. It would be nice to do it in ambient conditions. Have you tried that? Is it, will it tolerate some uh, humidity during processing? Um, yes, actually, it's, it certainly does. I mean, all of our first results for the first year or two that we were working on this technology were done in air. And it's only more recently that we're starting to do things in the glove box just because we don't want to deal with the variability of our, our clean room humidity is not well controlled. So depending on the day, it will be between 30 and 80 percent humidity. So we'd like to control that. Um, I think well, we, we can definitely produce good solar cells at below, let's say, 50 or 60 percent relative humidity at, at room temperature. And we, when the humidity is that low, then we do do that. So it, it's definitely possible. And probably, I mean, you may have seen a paper by Young Young where they actually believe that controlled amounts of humidity is, is, a, is a positive thing for the solar cells. So they, use, they, they process in 30 percent humidity and get improved performance. Why, I'm not sure. I think, I think we chose it because it's something that we were using to protect the samples for our spectroscopy studies because it's just it's, uh, soluble in compatible solvents. It's definitely not going to be the, the best material. Poly we also use polycarbonate, which is better. Um, but there's obviously scope for using as hydrophobic of a polymer layer as we can uh, for, this, for this application. And in fact, we've, we've done a bit of work with some different hole transporters, actually, by cha changing the hydrophobicity and um, removing all ionic, ad, uh, all ionic uh, components in that whole transporter. And you can see that there's one that we've got here. Uh, this was in collaboration with Alan Selinger um, at NREL at Colorado School of Mines, that when you leave it in a, in a beaker of water for you know, a few minutes, there's no change in the color. So by playing with the hydrophobicity, you can definitely make improvements. A similar question about the mechanism of protection by carbon why? What is the mechanism of ah, protection? It's, it's si right, sorry. Um, it's simply, we believe that it's simply preventing moisture from being able to access the perovskite layer itself. So it seems that this, that uh, heating on the hot plate only has an effect when there's ambient moisture around. And the way we see it is that this moisture is entering into the perovskite and is sort of breaking the methyl ammonium um, halide bonds, hydrogen bonding, is breaking that hydrogen bonding to allow it to then be able to, to, to sublime. Well, it's, that's actually not, uh, that could be possible as well, but I think it's, it's really just that the PMMA is more hydrophobic than our normal whole transporter layer, and so prevents the moisture from getting to the perovskite layer. That's what we think. 